uh, all the uh, plumbing issues were corrected. All yes, they were. They were able to wake up this morning and have a nice and hot shower. So uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you back. And uh, fathers and grandfathers, happy uh, Father's Day. So it's, uh, the, the weather outside is a little different than we had for Mother's Day. Today we look out with some fog. I always like to say my father bring a little bit of sunshine but uh, uh, speaking of that. Uh, just a couple of things before you, you go on your, your break. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the cruise last night. Uh, and I hope you had an opportunity to kind of co-mingle and talk to each other and find out what Use each of you as resources. Uh, some of you are just starting out, others of you have been around for 13, 14 years. Uh, so you're, you've already experienced the things that the, the new people uh, are, are going uh, through. Uh, also, uh, all the sessions yesterday and today are being filmed. Uh, we will have a CD that we will send to all the board presidents, and we will also have it on our, our website. So. If you have board members that weren't able to attend, they'll be able to do some of the uh, presentation. Uh, another thing is in August, uh, August 6th and 7th, uh, we're going to have an administrator's retreat uh, for all of the administrators of your academy. And I've also told them that they can bring uh, key personnel. Uh, and we're also going to have a, a finance meeting at that time. So anybody that's in your business office uh, are going to be welcome to come because uh, Becky's going to put on some a workshop for them so they know exactly what their uh, quarterly report should uh, look like, uh, what you need to be looking for when you buy it, when it comes back. So everybody is going on, on the, the same uh, page. Uh, this morning we start with the uh, student achievement uh, workshop, which will be in this room. Uh, then we have the uh, Becky uh, class of putting on the, the finance across the hall. And then at uh, 10 o'clock, we have the ESP uh, session in here. And then the bid contract is back in the Ontario room. And that puts us at what, 11. And then we have the, the tours. Uh, again, shuttle the out uh, front. It takes those that are going to the nursing lab. And uh, Dr. David Finley, uh, who is the dean for the engineering uh, department uh, will meet uh, the rest of us in the lobby and take us over to the, uh, the engineering Any questions? Before you... No questions? Do uh, you want to get yourself another cup of coffee and roll before you walk over and then get started?
know about those important things that are going on in your school, and you have to embrace the uh, assessments that measure what students know and are able to do at all the various levels. So, um, I hope you can tell my position already. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I don't have sympathy for those who test patch. The tests aren't bad things. They're, they're tools for us to help understand what our students know and are able to do. So I will talk about student assessment. Then we're going to get to those questions. What, when, who, how, and we'll talk about some examples and we will recap. There's two takeaways that I hope you can leave here today with. One is, although we're going to talk about assessment and questions, again, think of big picture, what's your role in that? You as a board member of the Charter Public School, what is your role? And finally, I'm going to leave you with a handout. Down here, I'm not going to hand it out yet. And it's one method you might try in managing your board meeting. And I hope that helps, and uh, I hope it complies with what your charter authorizer would like to see in a board meeting, but we'll see. We'll uh, get to that. The National Charter School Institute uh, spent a lot of time working with board. And one of the things we say and follow are the principles of the gentleman named Jim Collins. Has anyone heard of Jim Collins? Who's the great? That's Green Belt. It's a, it's a book that was published a few years ago. Uh, uh, important book if you're uh, running an organization uh, that's for profit. Jim Collins followed it up with something called uh, Good to Great in Social Sector. Which really, uh, if you haven't had a chance to read that book, it's, it's, I like it of this day. Very, very thin, easy read, good to great in social sector. And he talks about disciplined people who have disciplined thoughts and have had disciplined actions to achieve their goals. So we're, I'm going to bring that up a couple of times. Disciplined people, disciplined thoughts, and disciplined actions. You're already disciplined people. You're up in Sault Ste. Marie on a Sunday morning on Father's Day. So you've actually made a serious commitment to, to what you do. And that's great. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the disciplined thoughts. Uh, in terms of this topic and then some of the actions you can take. You already have to start thinking now. So charter schools are all about accountability. I was looking at your mission statement, and some of you even have the word accountability in your mission statement. So what are they accountable for? And who is the primary agent of accountability? So think about the second question first. Who is the a, who's the primary agent of accountability? When you think about charter school accountability, who is accountable? Who, who, what's the agent? Who does the accountability to stop? Can anybody think of what the answer to that might be? The board. Excellent. Some people say it's the authorizer, and they, they look to Nick, or they look to Bruce, and they say, well, you're accountable. You're the one who's more accountable. It's not the answer, it's the board. The board is accountable, and if you've ever heard the three questions, you heard the three questions of what you're accountable for? Anyone? I know Dave has. Dave, you're allowed to answer a couple of these. Okay, okay. What are the three questions? What's the board account for? What do you need to take care of? Did everyone hear that? No. Good. Think about it yourself for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so if you talk to your table, what are you accountable for? And if it's not, if you did hear it, um, would you differ? Would you add anything to it? Just think for a moment. What are you accountable for? So don't share your head or not out loud. Just at your table individually.
questions that you're authorized to allow. Is the academic program a success? Another way of saying it, are the kids learning? Is your uh, organization for which you're responsible, for which you're accountable, is it fiscally sound? And are you complying with the terms of your charter contract and all applicable law? Does anyone know what all applicable law means? <laughs> I don't. No one does. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of things. And fortunately, you have wise authorizers that are selected in what they do in terms of ensuring that you're in compliance with all applicable law. And they don't waste your time on, uh, on every one of them. So, three things. Is your academic program a success? Are you physically sound? And are you in compliance with the terms of your contract and the law? We're going to focus on, we, we, don't, we only have another uh, 40 plus minutes, and so we are only going to focus on the first of those. Here's what Michigan law says. Your offer, and this is new, 2012. Amazing that people think, well, didn't it always, wasn't this always the case? And it wasn't. Your authorized decision related to contract renewal must include increases in academic achievement for all groups of people as, and what I've gotten bold there is important, as the most important factor. And you probably already heard this from your authorizers. They are taking that seriously and they, will, they are uh, looking at your academic achievement and we'll get to the tools that are going to be used to do that. Don't try and read this. Uh, I know I couldn't find it the way that I am right now. I'm going to get into the details of your contract in just a minute. But basically, there's a lot of legal language in your contract. Who's read their charter contract? Three or four hands? Hey, uh, from the front to back? Excellent. Excellent. If you have, great. If you haven't, honestly, do you need to have memorized it? No. But if you're a charter school board member and you have not read your charter contract, I would strongly recommend that you go back and review it. It is the single most important agreement that exists within your school. You may have reviewed other agreements. You'll be talking about the educational service provider agreement if you have such an agreement later today. That's probably number two. You may have read your lease. I hope you've read your lease. That's number three. So number one is your charter contract. So please do make sure you go back and read your charter contract. So uh, this is some legal preamble. But it's important, it does say that you shall pursue the educational goals and you're going to demonstrate progress. Now what I did was I took a sample from one uh, contract. You can't read it, that's okay. Uh, this is in, does anybody know where this is in your contract? It's called the educational goal. Does anybody know what's going okay, The guy who had their hand up and said I read my contract? I'm at point one. Wow, I am very impressed. Absolutely. Schedule 7.1. Very good. Uh oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so that's, that's exactly where it is. Schedule 7.1 is the educational goal. So read the whole thing, and after today's session, definitely go back and look at Schedule 7.1 of your charter contract. And it has language that looks like this, which is very familiar to me. Uh, and as I went through a number of your charter contracts, I saw language, to be very frank, I, I think we're all about sharing in the authorizer community. It's actually language that I wrote as, as an author, as working for another authorizer is, is in uh, Lake Superior State University contract, which is great. Uh, I spent a lot of time on that language, and I, I'm glad that it's being used more widely than uh, one authorizer. So there's a lot of language in here. Some of it's not that easy to understand. I would certainly talk to your representative, your field rep, uh, to better understand it. And, and we'll get, uh, again, of that discipline action. Once you've read your charter contract, you understand your charter contract, then you have to go back and say, oh, I'm doing it. Before we go there, so we talked about what the, what the uh, charter law says, and we talked about what the charter contract says, and now you get to deal with Mark's says. I didn't say that, I, I'm repeating that. I've heard that a number of times, but, uh, Certainly, as you're talking about how you're doing, and you're asking questions, answers, and discussions, very nice. Data is even more important. Data is important, but as many of you know, in other industries as well, just looking at raw data can be uh, it can be it can be difficult. It can also be a big waste of time. It doesn't mean anything. So it's very important to take that data you have 
and ensure that somebody in the organization or that you're working with someone is turning it into information. It's just raw data is not very helpful. I'll talk to the OM team when I say turning data into information. And it's worth repeating. You, uh, so, oh, I just said uh, improper grammar in this uh, context. But a, a, a board uh, that is effective in doing what it needs to do using data constantly. So uh, there's, there's, that, there's probably no part of those other things that you mentioned. The academic program, the fiscal sounds, and the, uh, the law. Make sure that wherever you are, you can stay the law. So, where do you begin? I talked about assessments, we're going to talk about the cycle of assessments. But when you think about your organization and you want to know whether it's successful or not, what would be a good starting point? In terms of, I have to frame that better. <clears throat> Why? Well, we're going to ask some questions. Uh, who, what, how, when, and so on. What's another question that I didn't put in there? When you list those questions, but the important questions to ask. What, who, when, how, what's another word? Why. Very good. Why. So if you're thinking about why, and I even left that off, I'm assuming you've done that and you do that in your board meeting, why do you exist? Why do you actually exist as a charter school? For example, I don't have any favorites uh, at all in this room, but uh, uh, sorry, this is a Charles Heston Academy sticker I've been carrying around all year. Uh, and I know, I, I know a little bit about why Charles Heston Academy exists, but it's something you want to ask yourself. So, I would say a relentless focus on the mission. I've got one mission statement. I'm hoping the school whose mission statement this is can, act, can identify it. And then what about your school mission? Do you know your school mission? Uh, if you're sitting with your work colleagues, discuss it with one another, see if you can write it down. It's going to take a couple minutes. What's your school mission? Why do it exist? Why are you there? Why, is your, why are you here? Why, what are you all about? And one of you has the answer up there. Academy, are you here? Do you know what Grant Travers here? 
Alright, well that's Mr. Grant Travers Academy, mission stage. So what about the rest of you? Did anybody did anybody, was anybody able to put it down in words from memory? Close. Close? Alright. It is a good exercise. Because that is why you exist. You exist, your school exists to achieve the mission. And, and what you want to do is that's, that's always the place to start, if you ask me. If you do not have a clear focus mission, and you're not working towards the achievement of that mission and constantly using data to tell yourself whether or not you're making progress towards achieving the mission, you have to go back to that question, why are we here? So, maybe something for the next board meeting. Speaking of board meetings, this is in the handout I just gave you. What do you do at board meetings? You're not talking about your mission and why you exist. Maybe you do, that's great. What do you do at board meetings? So in one of, on one of the sheets there, you, uh, if you turn to the slide, you can write that in your space. So talk, if you're from different boards, talk to each other. If you're on the same board, try to do that exercise. Break it down, you, know, you don't have to fill in all four. We already talked about three things that you're accountable for. But what do you do, what do you spend your time doing when you're meeting as a board? If you had to break it down to one, two, three, four, maybe more categories, and give a percentage, what are you doing as a board? Do you meet for one hour? Nobody has a meeting longer than an hour, right? <laughs> two hours? Nobody's ever met for longer than two hours, I'm sure. I know. It's, it's different. And it's just, there's times a year where you actually have to. You have the budget to consider and approve. You have an important contract. So you're going to have different lengths of meetings. But it's, take, why don't we take 90 minutes as an average for your board meeting? What do you do during those 90 minutes?
All right, I'd like to pull it back now. Uh, I hear some good conversation going on. Um, I'd like to hear from some of the uh, boards we haven't uh, heard from. Mm -hmm. Who's willing to talk about what they do during their board meeting if they have to break it down? How about over here? Great, yes. Okay. We need, we need Yeah, 
about that slide yet? What question? What question should you ask about screen performance? A baseline. Again, a great uh, idea from a, a new operator. If you don't know what your baseline is, you can't determine how far you've gone. Absolutely. Baseline is very important. Anything else? What test are we looking at? Absolutely. Great. What test are we looking at? Do you want to look at, do you want a, a monthly report of spelling uh, proficiency in the school? Spelling quizzes? Probably not, right? That's, down, that's a little too far into the lead. What about the running record of teachers? You know what that is, running record? You can use it in a couple of schools. Again, is that the right thing you probably want information on? So running records is what, in elementary education, a lot of teachers use to help them uh, help individual students. So when I say that, uh, you should probably go, no, we don't want to know about running records. We're, we're happy our teachers are using them, but we don't need that information to board up. Okay? I was just thinking uh, So you want to look at similar schools serving a similar population of students. 
The one last thing I'll say about that is uh, how much better. Uh, who's it, who, uh, I won't even mention, if you're, if you're in an area where the local school is notorious for doing poorly, is just doing a little better than those schools good enough? Nice student head shaking, that's good at it. Believe it or not, in the past, a lot of people thought of what? Oh, well, we're doing better than, is anybody from Ben Harbor? Here? I'll just use Ben Harbor, because Ben Harbor's not here. Um, if you say, oh, we're well, you know, we're doing better than Ben Harbor, right? That really, unfortunately, wasn't a very good part of that, or measure yourself again. And then finally, mission-specific goals. I think almost all of them, you call them local goals in your contract. So, uh, not all charter schools do that, not all charter school authorizers allow for that. It warmed my heart when I saw it in your charter contract, because that helps you focus on really specific pieces of your mission that aren't measured by standardized tests. So those are the questions. So when? These are just suggestions. Just suggestions. A calendar, you can make up your own calendar. It would be ideal to part of that uh, discussion you have about student performance. It's the summer now. It's a good time to look forward to the next school year. Uh, what have we got? Yeah, July, the year in review. You may still have a meeting in June, you know. Uh, yeah, again, this is just a suggestion, but it's just based on a pretty sound uh, experience. These are the results that are available in different months. And if you're not asking or talking about those things, then what are you talking about in January, for example? I was astounded. I actually attended a number of uh, meetings in, in January. And they're in Barber. They're called meet scores. And they're still in Barber in January. But all the schools have their meet scores in their hands and should have been looking at them and thinking about them and working with them. And why wouldn't the board want to know what's going on? You have to, again, this is embargo, which means they're not public yet. So you have to be a little bit cautious, but you can, you know, you're all intelligent adults, you can figure out how to ask cautious questions such that you're not making your beats for the public. Uh, performance series or NWEA, they're, those are wonderful because you get immediate results, and you can ask about the results immediately. So they're administered in September. By the time you meet in October, they're available, they may or may not have been analyzed, but why not ask about that's your baseline data. In October, maybe, you know, in some schools by mid-September, you've got your baseline data, you know how your students are performing on the basic scope and reading and math. Couple, I think I've got a couple of checkpoints there, December and April. One of the things with your local goals, your mission-specific goals, it's not a bad idea to ask yourself two or three or four times a year, are we collecting the data? Because more times than not, I've seen schools be really excited about their mission and, and their local goal or their mission specific goal. And when they ask themselves the question, how are we doing, they have no data. If they like, if they like their mission, they feel good about it, but they have no idea. So, a couple times a year. Any questions about this? Yes. Yeah, great question. There's a number of different ways to do it. So that's obviously for even some middle schools who feel that uh, they don't serve high school, but they prepare students for high school, sometimes follow their students in, in college. If you're a high school and you are preparing students for post-secondary, then there's, you can use something called uh, Student Tracker. So there's actually a tool out there that will take your student data and your student information and track students into 93% of post-secondary uh, seats in the United States, almost all. Basically, you can figure out where they've gone, and if they enroll, if they stick around, and they actually graduate from college. So that's, that's one option. Uh, it's not perfect. If you have the resources, it's better to stay in touch. A lot of schools are using social media, Facebook accounts, for example. And ultimately, what's great about that is you get them to come back. And you stay in touch with the graduates, and they support you, they support your mission. We've had we work with charter schools where graduates are now sitting on the board. We believe that charter school graduates are sitting on the boards of their former charter schools. And in some cases, they're working there. So stay in touch with your, uh, your alumni base if you can. And you serve, but even on this sense, you just want to know, did they go to college, if, if, if that's what you're measuring? Uh, are, they, uh, are they staying around? Are you preparing them adequately? And are they, are they succeeding? Unfortunately, most of the results are pretty dismal right now and in a lot of schools, but they're, they're not, they might think they've done a great job and when they actually track their students out. If you, if you 
been around the charter movement for a while. You've heard of schools like uh, KIPP Academy. Have anyone heard of KIPP Academy? There's approximately yeah, 130 of them around the country. KIPP stands for Knowledge and Power Program. One of the most successful high-profile charter uh, support, uh, organizations in the country. Another one is called Yes Prep. Again, they're in about four or five states. All about college preparation. When they, and, and I mean, tremendous school. Wonderful school. Doing great things for kids. When they followed their own kids into college, they were proud at this point. They weren't succeeding in their first or second year. They were dropping out, and most of them didn't finish in mean, six years. And they, they, they said, wow. And they, had, and they started putting resources into it. So they had actual positions in those schools to support their kids after they left. They said, we're here for them to succeed after they leave as well. And now we know they're not, so what are we going to do about it? Yeah. So they have success counselors, they call them sometimes, and, then, and they stay in touch. They stay in touch with social media, they can help, they can come to support, they connect them with other graduates. So it's a great question. There's no one single answer. Well, are you seeing any contracts, goals, or Yes, yes, there's goals, no, there isn't the data. So some schools have set the goal of preparing the students for success in college. And then they have to collect the data, or they or when they get it, it's not very positive. So there hasn't been really very much action around that. Some but not much. And Dave knows that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this topic, and I would if you're running a high school and you're not tracking the success of your students when they leave, you really need to question. Again, go back to your mission. So, any other questions about the council? Again, you can sit here and do a little bit, running a little short on time. I want to get uh, to a couple more questions. So, who should you ask? And this is a key principle of what's called program evaluation. Don't just rely on one source. Try whatever, whenever you're trying to get an answer to anything, try and do it. So, a couple. Of, uh, uh, suggestions, primary source, look at the data and information in front of you. Secondary source, maybe your authorizer, uh, you might have a consultant or a committee member, something other than just looking at the paper. And expert opinion is another idea. So get, you know, getting a third party to come in and say, you know, here's some feedback. And then if, if, if then you're, I hope you can read it, but this is uh, a little uh, bit of information I found on that is a data tip. And there's a website where I found uh, some interesting information you can get further. So if you're interested in that, I need a triangulation. So who? The main answer to that is more than one person. A little, I guess I'll give you a little story on that. As an authorizer, I remember going into a board meeting, and they were looking at primary data. It was being presented to them by ed their educational service provider. I came in to board meeting prepared to talk about exactly the same data, and they look different. Same detail, different views. How does that be? Same data, different views. One looked good, one didn't look good. We weren't, yes? It really was, and frankly, it was the Y axis. I mean, you know, that's the data thing, but they were skewed, to be very frank, it was skewed to look good by one party, and it was not skewed at all, simply the information in the most neutral sense from another party. I, will, I won't mention schools or management companies or anything, but that school doesn't no longer exist, I can tell you that. And I'd like to say that that was one of the steps along the way that, uh, you know, led to the term of that school. You have to ask wise questions and ask them more than one person.
pilot year coming up for six schools that are getting their midterm review. And they've asked the National Charter School is to come in and analyze the data. And put, we use a tool called Elevate 360. Before I get to the and it measures when to match that, achievement and growth, status and growth are measured by this tool. And it's measured against a standard. So often you can just see what your status is. And you see how far you've gone, but unless you've got a standard to which you're growing, it, it might not make a lot of sense. So the basis of the tool I'm going to show you um, takes this number here. 21 is the national average on the ACT, the college test that in Michigan everyone takes. It. They take down grade 11. And the other thing we know about the 21 is that if you get 21, at the end of high school, you will have a good chance of succeeding in two places. One, your first year of college, because you've got a better than 75% chance, no, a better than 75% chance of passing credit-bearing courses. And that's a measure of success. A lot of kids go to college these days, take remedial courses, spend all their student loans on that, get depressed, and, and, and there's just so many people not succeeding in college. And one of the reasons is they're not well enough prepared. So this is, it's not everything about college, but this, this helps them know whether or not they're going to succeed in their first year of college. ACT has also done some really good research to tell us that that's not just for college these days. If we want our kids who graduate from school to have a, uh, a, living, a, a job that earns them a living wage, these, this has similar skills. So the schools that they need to, to do well in the ACT is more than just uh, giving them an indicator college readiness. It gives you an idea of career readiness, meaning that they can go into the 21st century workplace and, and, and succeed. Or they have to get, again, not perfect, and there is no perfect indicator, but it's a good one, and it's one of the best we have. So, how do we measure that? Well, grade 11 is a lot too, it's too late to find out for the first time whether or not they're prepared. So we developed this thing called the trajectory of college readiness. These blue dots, are from ACT's own research that about 300,000 students, they follow all the way from grade 8. They gave them a test in grade 8, they gave them the same test in grade 9, they gave them a similar test in the same school scale in grade 10, and then they took the test in grade 11. And then they actually followed these kids, like, as we were discussing, into college. They had their data. They went to see how are these kids doing. And they know that if they're on that track, they succeed in their first year in college. And we said, well, that's great information. Schools should have that. Schools should know what their students are doing on these tests. Well, we also said, well, grade 8's a little too late, especially if uh, you're a K-5 student. So we did some research. We took it all the way down on those two tests that we mentioned, performance series and NWA math. And we backed the map with trajectory, saying, if a student is achieving those scores, they're on track. And if they're not, you know how far they've got to go to get on track. If they're above, well, you'd be comfortable, but we should expect growth of all students. So that's, that's the theory behind uh, this tool that I'm going to show you called Elevate 360. Any, any questions about that? And again, it's very simplistic. Um, it's not perfect. However, schools I can tell you have been using it are finding success in raising achievement to a level that's meaningful. Well, uh, that's a good question. Those tests that you mentioned, performing theories and math, have benchmarks at kindergarten and first grade. I'm talking about an accountability model now. So it'll be something you can discuss with your authorizer as to whether, you're right, we're talking about student achievement. Whether you use the scores at uh, K and first and how you use them is a local discussion. Some people, some experts will come and tell you, don't use them for accountability. Use them for information to, tell, to give you baseline data so what the National Charter Schools Institute, in cooperation with CMU, did was take the data and the ability to analyze it. We hired outside experts, people with PhDs, who know a whole lot about uh, measuring student achievement and how to do it in a way that is credible, that is reasonable and fair, meaning we're not perfect. As adults, we all know we're not perfect. We all have our flaws. Kids aren't perfect. Tests are not perfect. So the experts who understand that in, in 
incorporate something called standard error. It sounds a little scary, but there's a thing called the standard error of measure, and they incorporate that into the analysis. So you're never really thinking about a single score. You're thinking about achievement in a range. And that's one of the reasons you see little bars around the gospel. Those are status scores of the classes who are, are raised as students. And again, we're not today going to go into the depth of this tool, but in the future, um, the first of six schools that are using it right now, or that we're using it with uh, at LSSU, we're putting their data into this software tool, and we're producing charts like this. And we'll be meeting with the school leaders and explaining what the data looks like, and, and, and I've committed to Nick and Bruce and LSSU team. We'll come back and show you live results, show you the software tools, spend a lot of time just on this tool. Uh, we're convinced it's a good tool and that it really gives you that important information. So let me explain this chart. That's that, essentially that same trajectory that you just saw, that holographic trajectory. And what you can't probably read is that this is uh, grade 2 to 8 in the fall reading test, and they're newly enrolled students. So again, that's back to your baseline data. These are kids that came in in the fall, newly enrolled to your school. Should you be accountable for those students' success? Already? No. You haven't done anything yet. Right? You, you, you gotta have, you got to have time to do your damage before you can be held accountable. But it's important to know where they start. So that's the baseline data. And you can see, and this is a real school, by the way, and I spoke to the principal, and she doesn't mind me sharing this. That's their intake. That, those are students coming in. Some of them are, well, I won't get into the details. You can get the red is not good. Green would be good, or blue would be good if you have to put blue in the chart. And yellow, you have to have a little bit of caution when you're looking at that data. Any questions about that chart? I'm going to go quite quickly now, I'll have a few minutes. This is, at the end of the year, this is now in the spring, and this is a completely different set of students. These are three plus year students. I mean, they've been enrolled in this school for at least three years, maybe four, five, six, seven years. And you can see it looks different. These kids are either with great certainty, and that actually means 95% of certainty, if you want to get the statistics, of being college ready, or they're, you know, they're ready, but you have to have a little bit of caution. And that's essentially what this tool does. There's a whole lot, there's a lot more to it and different ways you can slice and dice and see trends and so on. I don't know the pictures I've got here that I'm going to show you. But that is one view of student achievement. The same school, uh, the same, same school, different students. Students coming in baseline, not where you want them. Kids that have been at the school, they've, got, they've had their time to impact these students, this one's working. Growth is also important. We talked about that. These are questions that you should ask yourself. We can't answer that today, would you? Definitely questions you want to ask yourself when you're talking about student achievement. And again, this is another view from that tool. This is actually growth from fall to spring of the same students that take the test. So you're not looking at two different groups. The kids who take in the fall and the kids who take in the spring, are they growing at a rate that either maintains their status as college ready or is good enough to get them college ready within three years? Complex stuff. We'll, we'll be back. We'll do more sessions on Elevate 360. But it takes at least an hour to an hour and a half to really uh, do this justice. We just wanted to introduce it to you the first time. I think I can, I can talk about the schools. It's uh, Grand Traverse Academy, Bay City Academy, uh, American you know, International Academy, Advanced Technology Academy, Regent Park Scholars. Regent Park Scholars. That's it. Okay with yeah, that, that's not one of my, right, my examples. <laughs> so there's six schools this year in your midterm reviews that are going to be seeing this real data. It's, ready, it's been loaded, much of it's been loaded. It also takes the explore, the plan, and the ACT data from 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. Could you go back to the slide? Oh, sure. The green is great.
Thank you. 